So welcome everybody. We're just giving you a couple of seconds for our audience to join our live Zoom audience. And then now we're going to get started. And uh, our program today is uh, sponsored by the International Association for Peace and Economic Development. Uh, it's one of the seven primary associations of the Universal Peace Federation. And uh, in this series that we hold every Tuesday at this time, which is two o'clock Eastern Standard Time, but uh, depending on where you are in the world, it could be a very different time. Uh, we are going to be looking at the pivotal role of Korea in today's world. It's a country that, as you know, is divided between North and South Korea and is always a, a source of consternation and worry in international politics. But we believe that uh, there are steps that we can take both from the Western side and from uh, the Korean side to be able to create the conditions for the peaceful reunification or at least an opening to take place between uh, North Korea and the rest of the world. And uh, so today's program is going to focus on the concrete and specific steps that North Korea can take to progressively modernize and open its economy following the example of countries like Vietnam and other communist countries that have made those steps to open up. So what objective conditions could the North Korean government implement in order to you know, have their economy take off uh, and generate the kind of dynamism that we've seen in Vietnam, where there's been a, a huge uh, growth in international trade. And I can't tell you how many times I've uh, opened up, uh, you know, a package these days and see those words made in Vietnam on it, right? So this has really been an example, I think, that uh, Korea could implement, North Korea could implement in their own dealings with the rest of the world. So both our speaker and our commentator today have a wealth of legal, academic, and uh, economic experience, but more importantly, some practical experience in the country. And uh, we're going to be turning to them to find out a little bit more about, you know, how we can draw parallels between these communist countries and the current situation in North Korea. So as we're going through these presentations, I invite you to write any comments or questions that you have uh, in the Zoom chat. And then when we get to the discussion portion of the program, we will be, uh, you know, I will pose those questions to our two speakers here so that they can answer them for you. So our first speaker today is Dr. Pablo Sanz Bayon. He's the Assistant Professor in Commercial Law from, from Comillas Pontifical University Law School. And I apologize if I'm butchering these words. My Spanish is not great. So, of course, no worries. <laughs> um, so his, re his research interests are in the field of law and economics. Uh, and he's also the co-director of the Garrigas Chair of Corporate Law at the FinTech Observatory. Did I get that right? In Comillas. Okay. I butchered that too. But uh, so very uh, experienced in law and economics, and his most, most recent academic research is focused on the regulation of new digital technologies, including distributed ledges and blockchain. And uh, if you want to know more about that, you can talk to him after the program, but not to me. <laughs> <laughs> he has worked very closely with the Korean Korea Legislation Research Institute, which is, is a consultative body of the Ministry of Justice of South Korea and has been invited to be a speaker at several of their events. And he has closely cooperated, uh, sorry, he, he's also been a guest speaker at the Korean Law for, for, Forum in 2021. Now, he's recently returned from spending some time in Vietnam over the summer because his wife is Vietnamese, and so he has uh, a lot of interest in that part of the world and, of course, in Korea. So, Pablo, I invite you to share your presentation, and okay. uh, uh, you can take a minute to do that and then take it away. Okay. I think everything is okay. Yes, that's great. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Okay, good afternoon. My first words are to thank Alan and Roger and your association, AAID, for inviting me to participate in this seminar. It is an honor for me to contribute to the reflection on such an important issue at the global level, such as peace and security in the Korean Peninsula. My focus will be to analyze how trade and market integration can contribute to the peace and security of the Korean Peninsula and to the achievement of the reunification of the two Koreas. For this purpose, my task in this forum is to place the reflection from a comparative perspective in order to illustrate what examples or models can be useful for North Korea to internally promote the necessary changes for its own development. To do this, I will take Europe and specifically Germany as a first example, and then Vietnam, which will connect with the, what Felix will comment on later. First of all, I would like to speak about the nature of German unification and whether any of its lessons could be applied to the eventual reunifications of the Korean Peninsula. German unification in 1990 is often referred to a textbook case for the Korean Peninsula. But we don't have to forget to set the stage for the success of German unification. Helpful, helpful external influence included the end of the Cold War, the United Nations support for the two plus four talks, support from the Commission on Security and Cooperation, and the ability of NATO and the European Union to absorb a unified Germany. The division of Germany occurred shortly after World War II. The Soviet Union gained control of the East while the Un United States, the United Kingdom and France gained control of the West. For Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor of West Germany, his priorities were to pursue amicable relations with the West and regain his country trust within the international community. With the ascendancy of Willy Brandt to the chancellorship in 1969, came the implementation of Ostpolitik, normalized relations with several Eastern European countries and de facto relations with the East German. Mr. Brandt signed a formal treaty with the East Germany in 1972, which included agreements for the reunifications of family members, as well as cultural, educational, and economic exchanges between the two German states. This policy of rapprochement was continued by Chancellor Helmut Smith. During the presidency of Ronald Reagan in the USA, the Cold War intensified. Nevertheless, talks between the two German states continue under the umbrella of the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe which provided institutional support for the eventual unification of the country. The late 1980s marked perestroika and the breakup of the Soviet Union as the empire started to crumble. Premier Mikhail Gorbachev renounced the Brezhnev Doctrine in 1988, thereby allowing the East European countries to choose their own path. Internationally, Germany needed the cooperation and consent of the two plus four powers and had to make clear that unification was part of the larger peace process in Europe. In 1990, a treaty was signed between East Germany, West Germany, Soviet Union, USA, France and Great Britain. Most importantly, Germany agreed that it had no irredentist claims on the territory it lost as a result of the World War II. Also, Germany renounced the use of biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons and attested that war could not be initiated by the new state. Germany achieved what Korea still can achieve, namely peaceful unification. There are several similarities between the divided Koreas and the formerly divided Germanys. In both cases, 
the division grew out on the Second World War and the following Cold War. The divided nations have totally different systems of government. North Korea, as a communistic one-party state, is a kind similar to the East Germany and South Korea, as a democratic republic is similar to the West Germany. Major differences are apparent in the economic development between North and South Korea, which again corresponds to the situations in Germany at the end of the 1980s. In light of these similarities, an important question to answer is the following one. What lessons can the Korean Peninsula learn from the German unification? The opening of the Berlin Wall and German unification was made possible by both internal German changes and by external changes in the Soviet Union. Firstly, Mikhail Gorbachev introduced his policies of perestroika, literally restructuring, and glasnost, literally openness, to prevent that the dissatisfaction of the masses in the communist bloc leads to uprisings, as in Hungary in 1956 and Prague 1968. These policies envision radical reforms of the Soviet state, economy, and society, and Gorbachev opened the door for democratization in the Eastern Bloc outside of the Soviet Union. The question now is, will be able to see similar restructuring and openness measures by the Pyongyang authorities in the near future? In my opinion, the key element that explains the success of German reunifications is that internally, the German population, both in the East and in the West, wanted a rapid unification. Despite it posed many problems and challenges, especially since the two states were at such different levels of economic development and had such different states structures. In particular, the economic experiment of transforming a centrally planned economy into a market economy had no predecessors in history. The two states had to start from scratch and try to develop adequate and feasible mechanisms how to transform both systems. It became obvious that the population of the East Germany prefer rapid unification as a market economy over any type of reform socialism, which they made clear with the vote they cast. The other key element is the support of the international community. Europeans experienced the division of the continent after the Second World War. The unification happened when many did not believe in it anymore or put it into a far future. For this reason, Europe carries a valuable experience of rapprochement of the divided continent, cutting down an iron curtain and growing together again with the European Union. This process and experience might contain some helpful, helpful lessons for Korea. Korea deserves the firm support of the international community so that it can come together and be united again. In particular, Pyongyang authorities can learn from the unification of East and West Germany and remain visionary because the fall of the Iron Curtain was blessing, was blessing for Europe. Achievements were many, extra jobs, exchange of people in different fields like academia, culture, and sports. The unification between East and West Germany was good for the whole Europe and not only for Germany. Therefore, the unification of North and South Korea will not only be good for Korea, but for all Eastern Asian nations as well. As we will see later with the Vietnamese experience, the reunification of Germany is a challenge that should invite North Korea to reflect on its future. Economic logic puts centrally planned economy towards dictatorship. The logic of, of this is very simple. 
the maintenance of internal prices far at variance with the rest of the world requires a massive police apparatus to prevent people from exploiting the latent gains from trade. This point could be seen most clearly in East Germany, which had only to look west to see the alternative. Marxist emphasis of materialism was ultimately the East-West German regime undoing. Once it was clear to all that capitalists could generate greater material prosperity than socialism, the logics of the socialist state evaporated. Indeed, they attributed the bloodless collapse of the communist regimes throughout Central Europe to the communist authorities' respect for the iron law of history. Once the masses were in opposition, resistance was pointless. A simple fact reveals this inefficiency and a structural collapse. No official indicators of North Korea overall macroeconomic conditions have been published since 1965. Exceptional economic figures published by, by North Korea are not considered trustworthy since they are used for propaganda purposes to promote the regime. For this reason, the Bank of Korea since 1990 has applied capitalist methods of estimations to assess North Korea macroeconomic indicators, and these may be the only meaningful figures for reference. The, as we know, the standard prescription for economies in transition from central planning to the market is, in first place, macroeconomic stabilization, then liberalization of domestic trade and prices, current account convertibility, privatization, creation of a social safety net, and finally, the creation of a legal framework commercial transactions. Through monetary union and absorption into West Germany, most of these goals were achieved in a decisive fashion. The lessons of the German unification experience are of two sorts. First is the identification of mistakes to avoid. And second, what kinds of change can be made in policy in anticip anticipation of unification? The first set of lessons is rel relatively straightforward. The consensus among economists is that the one-to-one -one exchange rate was not the primary cause of the depression in East Germany. Indeed, the increase in the money supply was greater than what would have been justified on the grounds of proving liquidity to the East German economy, yet inflation did not materialize. The lesson for Korea, if there is one, is that the competitiveness problems are likely to be severe that a little extra liquidity may not be a bad thing. One thing that might help would be to dollarize North Korea South trade, North and South Korea trade, to try and start getting an idea of the North Korean real exchange rate and the North Korean saddle price of foreign exchange. Rather than the exchange rate, the Germans made one obvious mistake, in my opinion. It, this was the policy of driving East German wages beyond productivity. This had the effect of depressing output in Germany and probably encouraging westward migration. This mistake should be avoided for the Korean case. Although a reunified Korea could be larger and more powerful than a divided territory, it will, it will not be the most powerful nation in Northeast Asia, unlike Germany in Europe. From my point of view, a rational analysis of Korean reunification shows the following benefits. Power enlargement, a larger market, elimination of division costs, humanitarian reunion of divided families, and humanitarian salvation for North Korean impoverished residents. However, despite the possible benefits, South Korean politics are divided over a continuing coexistence 
versus a reunification costing a high price and creating social conflict. German style reunification, essentially an absorption of North Korea on South Korea terms, is the only possible and realistic scenario to consider. And that's only if events play out of fairly peacefully. Anyway, the process will take for far longer and cost far more. In fact, the work of German reunification remains unfinished. The German government still publishes an annual report on the status of German unity. In addition, workers in Germany continue to pay a solidarity tax of 5.5% of income tax paid that goes to the East. In total, some experts estimate reunification has cost the country more than $2 trillion. By contrast, Koreans will have to shoulder a greater burden. In 2021, South Korean per capita GDP was more than $34,000. The same year, North Korean was $1,700,000, a 20 to 1 differential. It will take generations for North Koreans to catch up and enjoy the same prosperity as South Koreans. Other research estimates that even by temporary integration, the North income level will be 34% of South in 2039, from 4 to 5% in 2020. It means that it will take considerable time to complete the integration. Another one estimated that Korean reunification will cost around $3 trillion immediately and an additional $7 or $8 trillion in the first decade or almost seven times South Korean annual GDP. For this reason, the younger generation of South Koreans is not very keen at all to see reunification because they know they will have to pay for this. Despite the obvious economic cost, the goal of a politically unified Korean peninsula has a social and national logic. Koreans have been one people for hundreds of years until 70 years ago. Their destiny is to be together. Germany first became a unified country in 1871, and it was unified until 1945. That is not a long time, less than 75 years. It is a young country. But Korea was one nation for 1,269 years. In South Korea, there are 10 million people who live as a separate families. There are no strangers. That means that on one hand, it is very homogeneous. On the other hand, it is very well integrated socially. So it is maybe in some sense easier for Koreans to integrate with one another on an individual basis. But before this, it is necessary a formal end of the war and a normalization process in the relationship and to make sure that the reunification is an issue that is accessible to young people and next generations in South Korea. In my view, a long, painful process of reunification between the North and the South will be avoided. The effects on South Korean social harmony will be huge, with 25 million poorly educated citizens who have no idea how the modern world operates and likely to become second-class citizens. The good thing about reunification in North Korea is full of natural resources, high-quality coal, iron ore, rare earth metals, plus a 25 million populations, a disciplined cheap workforce, which speaks the same language. North Korea has geographically advantage with relates to China and Russia on shore and close to Japan and has abundant natural resources and labor forces. Also, it serves the militarized zones, which has 
well-preserved natural ecology with South Korea. The real fact is that just the older generation of South Koreans are much more enthusiastic about reunification because they have their loved ones left behind during the war. They want to see their native village one last time before they die. By contrast, North Koreans are more realistic, both the elites and the common people. They know South Koreans live better. They know South Korea is stronger, and if they unify, the result will be that they are treated as second-class citizens. For this reason, they are not rushing to the reunification, at least not immediately. They know they need some time to improve economic output, to learn about capitalism and the contemporary world. So from my point of view, the longer North Korea waited for reunification, the safer it will be for all the parties involved. Finally, we are going to briefly introduce some reflections on how Vietnam, like Germany, can represent a certain example of or model for North Korea to move towards a more developed economy based on its integration into global markets. So the question is, could North Korea be the next Vietnam? Vietnam offers a roadmap, not just for upgrading an economy, but also recuperating after years of isolation and crucially keeping a grip on power. A decade or so after the Vietnam War ended in 1975, the ruling Communist Party introduced the so-called Doi Moi reforms with a view to nurturing a socialist-oriented market economy and lifting its people out of poverty. It encouraged foreign investment, reduced subsidies for state-owned enterprises, and allowed farmers to sell surplus crops. Vietnam now has more than a dozen free trade agreements and an economy that is expanded at an average clip of 6.6% since 2000, boosting annual incomes to almost 2,600,000 2, euros from about $400. Vietnam is now a manufacturing hub with an economy now six times the size of North Korea. For instance, Samsung factory in Vietnam produce half of Samsung smartphones and accounts for 25% of Vietnam's exports. Samsung has brought more than 100,000 jobs to Vietnam. So what is the secret of Vietnam? Vietnam adopted a comprehensive international integration strategy after its economic reforms began to yield successful results. In 1995, it normalized relations with the USA. And within the Association of South Southeast Nations, it has been registering the block fastest economic growth. Let's mention three main reforms. Probably the single most important reform was returning agriculture to family farming. Vietnamese family did not have firm, tradable property rights, but they had confidence that under the new system, they could be able to sell and profit what, from what they grew. Agriculture output immediately jumped 20%. Vietnam also allowed small private companies to start operating so that there was some expansion of urban output as well. Restaurants, taxi services, small scale manufacturing through not as dramatic as rural transformation. A second key reform was liberalizing foreign trade and investment. Rice exports had been banned, which had a certain logic when the country could not feed itself. Fortunately, the ban was lifted just as rice production shot up. Vietnam immediately became the third largest, largest exporter of rice in the world market. This is a great example of how reforms interact. Vietnam began 
importing a wide range of manufactured goods, such as TVs and motorcycles, and that contributed to higher living standards. While Vietnam started off exporting rice and fruit, it is a densely populated country whose comparative advantage lies more in manufacturing and services. This is where direct investment came in. Vietnam legalized foreign investment and quickly attracted labor-intensive producers of footwear, garments, and later electronics. Foreign investment also helped it to develop as a major tourist destination. More than 10 million jobs have been created by the sport sector, some directly exporting, but a majority indirectly exporting. In other words, value change has expanded backwards into the domestic economy, and Vietnamese firms, many of them small and medium-sized enterprises, provide parts and services to the big firms that account for most of the sports. A third key issue was financial stabilization. Vietnam had impaired inflation in the mid-1980s. The underlying problem was the consolidated public sector, government plus state enterprises, had a large deficit that could not be financed by domestic savings of foreign assistance. The government was printing currency and expanding credit from the central bank to state enterprises at a rate that generated a very high inflation. The government underwent a large scale retrenchment with millions of workers leaving the public sector. Fortunately, the private sector was expanding so rapidly that the unemployed were rapidly reabsorbed, reabsorbed and finally Vietnam brought its inflation down to single digits. For all these factors, I strongly believe that Vietnam is an attractive model for Pyongyang. In North Korea, if North Korea decides to open its highly the centralized socialist economy, Vietnam's model of development could be a blueprint to emulate. The situation in North Korea is similar to what prevailed in Vietnam from 1975 to 1994, when post-war Vietnam faced harsh economic sanctions and trade embargo. By choosing free market economy reforms in 1986, Vietnam's per capita GDP increased by more than 24 times in 35 years. It is projected that by 2045, when Vietnam celebrates 100 years of independence, its per capita GDP could reach $18,000. Similarly, if North Korea pursues an economic reform strategy in cooperation with its willing southern brother, it could expect to experience a similar fit. At the same time, it will be desirable to create new business in North Korea. There could be a role for fiscal incentives here. South Korean firms are already relocating labor intensive activities abroad. However, investments in the North Korea may be associated with a positive external externality since it will be presumably reduced unification costs. Private capi capital will also be needed to, for re reconstruction. Private foreign capital inflows will, will be facilitated by an open investment regime. Assuming that Unified Korea will adopt South Korean laws and practices, unification considerations will reinforce the desirability of improving the South Korean's in war foreign investment regime. With respect to trade, the unified Korea will presumably operate under South Korean trade policies, including tariffs, quotas, etc., which will mean substantial disprotection for North Korean enterprises. Some have advocated the application of dumping rules internally to protect South Korean producers. But this will be a mistake, in my opinion. The priority will undoubtedly be on maintaining production in the North. In conclusion, there could be a good rationale for Pyongyang to take counsel from Hanoi. Both are good friends. North Korean supported Vietnam during the Vietnam War. 
Its founding father, Kim Il-sung, visited Vietnam twice. Also, despite China emerging as a strong competitor and a an, an adversary of Vietnam and others on the issue of the South China Sea, it has become an important economic partner, as it is with North Korea. China economic power and ambition in Asia help maintain some balance between the three communist states, China, North Korea, and Vietnam, despite a strong political difference, which is why the Vietnamese model could be an appropriate option for North Korea to choose. If Kim decides to opt for a new strategy line by pri prioritizing economic development, it will be a good choice. In this regard, we have reason to be optimistic. In the last eight years, Kim did introduce measures to reduce the size of farms and allow some agricultural production for households and for sale in markets. These reforms have seen expanded with greater emphasis on decentralized decision making. This demonstrates that Kim is not completely averse to reforms and he can receive assurance about regime stability, the country future could take a different turn. But for now, with harsh sanctions in place, any hope of following the example of Vietnam or any other country is impossible or extremely difficult. So the onus is on both the USA and North Korea to find a solution. Instead of focusing solely on denuclearization, the focus ought to be on this kind of change. Let me conclude with some final remarks. The unification of Korea as a democratic capitalist state is undoubtedly in the interest of both Koreans and the world at large. The German and Vietnamese experiences suggest that this transition, when it comes about, is likely to be difficult in the short run, however. Most of the decision about and responsibilities for unification will be borne by Koreans. Comparing notes on German Vietnamese and Korean unification does not suggest that there are easy approaches available to replicate the success of one unification process in another and very different operation, operational environment. The people of East Germany wanted to have reunification as soon as possible. This produced so much pressure that not politicians could say no. By contrast, North Koreans should not be allowed to immediately come to South Korea. In my opinion, I am of the opinion that the border should be controlled and sanctions policy should be lifted or reviewed in the coming years. If they live separated for more than 70 years, Koreans can wait some more years until it is stabilized. Korea has an example in Germany and Vietnam. Two examples that prove successful. The Korean people are eager to make a reunification work and they could learn from Germany and Vietnam. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Pablo. Um, Thank you so can, much. Can you stop sharing your screen? Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. That was a a really interesting presentation, and I have so many questions about it, but I want to give a chance to Felix to respond to this uh, before we go into the discussion. And if anybody else has questions they want to post into the chat, please go ahead. Um, one point I would just like to make in listening to your uh, presentation here is that the model of Germany actually is kind of a warning to North Korea of how they don't want to do it because if they go that route, you know, mm -hmm. East Germany as a nation kind of no longer exists um, and was completely absorbed. But the Vietnamese model, I think, offers a, a better path for them to be able to open up and maintain some kind of uh, independence and uh, control over that process of opening. Our next um, uh, speaker here is Mr. Felix Abt a serial entrepreneur, a coach, trainer, and consultant. And during his career, he's developed and managed a variety of businesses, 
in different countries. He worked as a senior executive at multinational corporations such as the Swiss Swedish ABB Group, which is one of the largest producers of uh, electrical components for generation and distribution systems in the world. So his first book, A Capitalist in North Korea, My Seven Years in the Hermit Kingdom, was uh, uh, published a few years ago, I think uh, 2012, if I'm correct. And uh, this uh, details his experience working in North Korea for uh, ABB Group and for other companies he set up. He actually established a pharmaceutical company in North Korea and uh, I think was one of the first people to actually do advertising in North Korea and has many, many uh, valuable experiences and personal details. And there's lots of pictures in here. If somebody's looking to read a good book that describes um, life in North Korea from a, a very practical, realistic uh, viewpoint and explains, you know, the, the legal and the business and the social interactions that go on, I think it would truly be a worthwhile book to purchase and read. Um, so. In addition to living in North Korea for seven years, uh, he is now a resident in Vietnam, and I'm really grateful that he's joining us because right now I think it's one o'clock or one thirty in the morning in Vietnam where he is. So we really appreciate him joining us from Vietnam. So, uh, Felix, I'd like to turn it over to you so that you can uh, share your experience and your viewpoint on this very important topic. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, and I applaud your efforts, the efforts of your organization to uh, promote peace and the reunification of the two Koreas. And so I would, um, I, I think the, the example that uh, Pablo described of the reunification of the two Germanys is, is very interesting and certainly, um, we, we certainly can draw uh, lessons uh, from that experience for for the two Koreas. Um, if you, uh, I would like to give you uh, to talk more about the three uh, countries: China, Vietnam, and North Korea, because they have uh, also a lot of um, things in common. And I would like to talk about uh, short, briefly about. The, their respective reform process. Uh, so China uh, came out of a cultural revolution, which uh, was uh, had, a, had a negative impact on uh, the food situation of the Chinese. And uh, so in, in 1978, the successor to Mao Zedong, uh, which was a rehabilitated reformist, he started the, ref the reforms in China, Deng Xiaoping. And what he did, and, and, and these reforms, the reforms in China, in Vietnam, and in North Korea, when they slowly started, had one uh, common cause. It was uh, a shortage of food. They, they all had serious food problems. So what the Chinese did, uh, they started uh, decollectivizing uh, agriculture, slowly but surely. Then, the, then they, they went on, they did not have a blueprint for reforms. So they were uh, experimenting with, with reforms. And these reforms were supported by both the party and government officials and the, the population. And then uh, these reforms continued. They, uh, uh, of course, it was, uh, they were at the beginning regionally confined, for example, to, to, border, uh, to border cities uh, no, a bit, uh, along, or along, the, along the sea. And uh, the, so, so after agriculture was, was uh, 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 reformed or partially reformed, the next step was to uh, open the country up for foreign investment. 
and to help it industrialize. So foreign investment and also local uh, private enterprises were allowed. Now, you, you had, uh, and, and of course, what it meant for China is uh, that it, like, like Vietnam, as, as uh, Pablo uh, explained before, uh, China developed very fast thanks to, these, uh, to this reform process. In Vietnam also, uh, Vietnam was a um, member of the Comic-Con uh, group of countries, the socialist countries led by the then Soviet Union. Uh, so we traded within this association and it was dependent on food aid from the Soviet Union until the 80s. And then the Soviet Union and the, 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 this Comic-Con association became weaker and weaker and was not able, the Soviet Union in the 80s uh, was not able anymore to provide food aid to, to Vietnam. So Vietnam had a, had a big food issue. So also at, then uh, in the early 80s, uh, the Vietnamese uh, uh, Communist Party decided also to go the way of uh, decollectivization of agriculture, give more give plots to individual Vietnamese, to farmers, which they could uh, cultivate and the produce could be sold on markets uh, for profit. And then in, as, as Pablo said, in 1986, there was this, uh, uh, also uh, 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 something important happened. Uh, there was a, the, a conservative, a conservative party leader, died in 1986. He was against reforms and his successor uh, was younger and was pro-reforms. And so these reforms got a boost in, uh, from 1986. And in, I think in 1991, uh, a law was passed which allowed uh, private enterprise in Vietnam. And it continued, it added uh, uh, foreign direct investment laws. It also wanted, Vietnam wanted to attract uh, lots of foreign investment like the Chinese did. And I think uh, China was a little bit the, the role model for Vietnam. So Vietnam did not have to, to experiment with reforms as China did. Uh, it could, it could uh, learn from China, take the, uh, the things that went well and, and avoid the things that did, uh, did not go so well. In North Korea, uh, reform started actually uh, quite early in already the first uh, reforms uh, were already in the 1970s when the central government allowed uh, provincial governments to set up their own uh, uh, enterprises. Of course, that was not not huge at the time, but it was a first step. And then um, North Korea, the, the, the big uh, the, the sea change was when there was a big, uh, there were a big natural calamities in the 90s, in the, in the second half of the 90s, when uh, there were big floods and uh, which devastated uh, large parts of uh, the infrastructure and the agriculture of North Korea. And at the same time, North Korea was also uh, dependent on, on food aid from the Soviet Union and uh, depend on trade with the Soviet Union and, and the rest of the socialist countries in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and because these, uh, that was about to collapse. So North Korea did not have uh, um, the food aid and, and the possibility to trade. It had not yet opened other trade channels at that time. So uh, that was a severe blow to the country and it had a, huge, uh, it had a se very serious uh, uh, food problem. So it also started in, in, the, in the 80s. So people, people started to grow their own food somehow. So, so I uh, started trade, started doing small manufacturing like uh, uh, making shirts and uh, making a little, uh, some garments. And um, that was not yet 
officially allowed. Uh, the first so-called farmer farmers markets uh, emerged in the late 80s. And um, in the 2000s, in the two early 2000s, these uh, so-called farmer markets, they were legalized. Um, and uh, these uh, farmer markets then um, uh, morphed into general markets. So uh, then you had you had a more uh, small uh, small scale business uh, that emerged and so on. So uh, what I want to say is is they had and, and then of course North Korea also started started uh, inviting uh, foreign direct investment. They knew that they needed foreign direct investment to uh, get technology and, and get uh, the capital to, to, to develop the industry and infrastructure. So they, they also uh, uh, created the foreign direct investment law and other laws uh, which uh, supported that uh, uh, development. So we had, uh, uh, so, so we have quite a few similarities when it comes to reforms. Thank you. Um, Felix, uh, from your experience working in North Korea, um, you, when, what year did you actually leave North Korea? I left in 2009. 2009, okay. Um, you still have relationships with uh, people in North Korea? Still, I'm just wondering, you know, what's the situation there now? Do you have uh, any insight into how things are, are going now, you know, during this time of COVID and uh, what effect the sanctions have had on the country as well? Well, the sanctions, of course, uh, started uh, uh, much earlier when I was still there. And uh, uh, they had already, uh, they had a, a severe impact on economic activities. Um, uh, certainly, in, you know, if you want to uh, develop a civil society, a, a middle class, which is also pro-reform and pro and 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 expects more rights, economic rights, but perhaps also political rights. Um, uh, this the, the development of this of the middle class, uh, the growth of the middle class has been stifled by uh, these sanctions, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately. So uh, also, of course, then foreign investors also uh, uh, gradually withdrew because it, it, uh, sanctions sanctions were uh, risky because uh, because they, they uh, if, if they would uh, inadvertently breach a sanction they may lose uh, a, a, a huge business in the United States or uh, and elsewhere mm. so uh, these sanctions had a, a, a tremendous impact now uh, I, I, I follow a little bit what is published in, in certain, uh, they have certain publications where the North Koreans, where they discuss how to develop the economy, how to, how to, how the, 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 the party should manage the state relation between party and, and civil, uh, civilian government. So how much uh, freedom the party, which of course, the, the party is more conservative because it is ideological, whereas the civilian government is more technocratic, is more pro-reform. So, and of course, there is a certain, uh, let's say, discussion or debate between the two, because the, 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 the civilian government would like to have more, uh, more competence mm -hmm. and uh, less uh, micromanagement from the party. And, and then also pass on competence to lower levels, to uh, individual enterprises and so on. So this discussion, uh, even during uh, COVID, has, uh, has, has continued inside North Korea. Of course, this COVID, uh, actually the, the failure of um, getting to an agreement with uh, uh, the United States when 
there was a meeting between uh, Kim Jong Un and President Trump in Hanoi. Yeah, uh, that hardened the the line a little bit, the political line in in North Korea. Because after that, Kim Jong Un said, "Okay, we have to re we, we have to rely on ourselves." So it was a, a, a little bit back, going back to a kind of isolationism. Mm, yeah. Maybe they were disappointed or frustrated or whatever and said, oh, okay, that, that didn't work out well with engaging with the outside world. So we have to rely more on ourselves. That was, that was a pity. And this, you can, you could, uh, it reflect, it's re reflected in all in this uh, economic and scientific uh, 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 journals that, that are published in North Korea. And, and those, the North Korea watchers who follow the internal discussions, they, uh, uh, there you can f know a little bit what's what's going on, which sure. in which direction. So so this uh, this Hanoi summit or the, the uh, and then this uh, the COVID pandemic has has made things a, li a little bit more more conservative and uh, but I believe uh, now that COVID is more or less under control, uh, they will. Uh, they will um, uh, um, accelerate to, the reforms a little bit, start again a little bit. Yeah, start to open up a little bit more and start to yeah. allow more freedom. Exactly. Yeah, um, my understanding is that there was, uh, in the last couple of years, there's been quite a kind of a crackdown on cross-border trade, and this has really stifled a lot of, um, you know, entrepreneurial activity in the country. Um, let's bring uh, Pablo back on now and we can uh, have a little bit of a discussion. Pablo, I'd like to hear your perspective on mm -hmm. um, sanctions as well and, and what's happening there. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I, I agree with Felix. I think that sanctions is the now is the big obstacle for the prosperity of North Korea. Uh, I think that if we want to see or to to um, to accelerate the process of reunification of the uh, Korean Peninsula, we need to review the policy or, or the sanctions policy, and in the last uh, instance to remove it, to remove them, uh, uh, to remove sanctions, in order to generate uh, prosperity uh, to 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 allow uh, North Koreans to, to, to make trade uh, with any risk of, of sanctions and to allow uh, businessmen like Felix to go to North Korea and to start creating business, uh, introducing technologies, introducing educational programs for the elites, for the of top officials of the regime. Um, I think that... Uh, we need to learn from from Vietnam. I think Vietnam is uh, uh, the, the best model, uh, better than uh, the German reunification. I think that, of course, Vietnam is the probably is the only uh, the the most uh, the closest uh, example or model for for North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam was very smart in the 90s, as you remember, your president Bill Clinton. Uh, restore the diplomatic relations with uh, with the government of, of of Vietnam, and from this point, uh, Vietnam started uh, growing, growing and growing, and now is the the Asian tiger. No, it's a big Asian tiger. So mm -hmm. um, I think that um, we need to 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 give a chance to Kim. Kim is uh, has some logic fear because uh, if he if he opens uh, north korea uh, probably the regime will be at risk and so we need to be careful to give some chance to develop its country to introduce some programs to develop companies uh, to give opportunities to 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 to, to this uh, private sector and public sector but uh, not to uh, not to put in risk uh, to the regime, because if not, we will have uh, a, a worse uh, situation. So mm. I, I agree with Felix uh, in also in the point that uh, we should to go to another Hanoi summit, not between uh, Trump and Kim. Instead of them, uh, we have Biden and, and Kim, but I think that it will be necessary um, from the Washington a point of view to 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 try to to try this 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 line to try this diplomatic line and Vietnam 
could be the base of this new to of of this uh, new uh, uh, time for 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 this relation new relationship um right. yeah yeah i think that um you make a good point there and uh the um you know the sanctions were put in place i think primarily to punish north korea for the nuclear program right to discourage them but uh, I think as we've seen, it really hasn't done that. It hasn't had that desired effect. Um, and if anything, I think it's um, made uh, Kim Jong-un more dedicated to his nuclear program in order because he's afraid. He's, there's kind of a fear there that things are going to change. Um, and conversely, it's, it's really affected the economic ability of the country um by closing it off um so from that perspective you know there's a lot of advantages to him going uh, to kim jong-un taking his country down the vietnamese path rather than the east german path where if you have that kind of sudden opening it could cause a lot of problems so um felix having lived in vietnam for you know many many years now what do you see as like the practical uh, effects in that country of, uh, you know, opening up and has it had an effect on like the political climate as well in Vietnam? Well, uh, let me first say that um, I was, um, it was interesting to see that under Kim Jong-un, there were many more, uh, many more uh, industrial parks for foreign investors were opened. All of, all over the country. Unfortunately, no foreign investors came because of the sanctions, but he, he, somehow they had this hope that uh, lots of foreign companies would, would, would come and set up shop uh, somewhere in North Korea. North Korea has, of course, a, a, a long experience. It had this uh, Razon special economic zone at the Chinese border since, since the 80s. And, uh, uh, already in the 80s, about 50 companies, 50 foreign companies invested uh, a few dozen million dollars in that Razon economic uh, zone. And that was also a, a kind of uh, field of experiment to experiment capitalism a little bit mm, right. uh, closed off the rest of the country, but they, they experimented with, with, with market economy. And um, so I, I realized that, that Kim Jong-un is, is, would like to do more in that direction when he set up so many, so many new uh, uh, industrial park economic zones. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the sanctions, nobody came. So um, in Vietnam, it's, uh, of course, we, after the reunification of Vietnam and, and, and from 1995, when the relations between the US and Vietnam was normalized. But I, I, I remind you that it took 20 years from the end of the war, the, the war ended in 1975, and the, the, the relations uh, were normalized between the US and, and, and Vietnam only, only 20 years later. So it took, it took quite some time. And then, uh, and that's why I, I was in, I, I, had a, I had a company in, in, in Hanoi at that time, and I remember. At that time, uh, when, the, when the internet, uh, there was already internet with this dial-up, uh, this dial-up system, you know, uh, went through the, the telephone. Mm -hmm. And at that time, before, before uh, Bill Clinton came to Hanoi to open the U.S. Embassy, uh, only a few thousand, only a few thousand Vietnamese had access to internet. And after, uh, this uh, the embassy was opened and and the, the, the Vietnamese government felt comfortable with the U.S. after they started uh, giving many more people access to the internet. The internet was kind of liberalized. Right. And when I came to when I came to North Korea from Vietnam at the time in 2002, I found the same situation: uh, dial-up internet, uh, very expensive, and only. Uh, a few hundred North Koreans had access to the to the internet at that time, but I believe uh, the same could happen in North Korea if one day Washington and Pyongyang decide that they would set up 
emphasis that they would end the war with a formal peace treaty and normalize relations, uh, they would become much more relaxed. Uh, they will not feel besieged and, 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 and uh, uh, fear for their, uh, for their mm. survival. Right. So I think things would become as relaxed as in Vietnam. That was my experience uh, here in Vietnam. So, um, you know, uh, North Korea has this uh, Juche ideology, this self-reliance. Um, and of course, Vietnam is the political system is based on the communist um, uh, principles as well. Um, have you seen a, a, a kind of a shift or a, an opening politically that people have more uh, kind of freedom within North, uh, within uh, Vietnam now compared to what you saw in Korea when you were there in North Korea? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, almost 50 million Vietnamese who have access to Facebook. Right, uh, okay. <laughs> if you compare with China, in China, there's no Facebook. Okay, they have their own they have the, uh, Facebook-like uh, uh, social media. But uh, uh, so there is more more openness, uh, much more openness in Vietnam than in, in uh, than in North Korea. Sure. But uh, but I, there is also there was a, also ideolo ideological changes in North Korea, which I, I witnessed myself. For example, in Pyongyang during the time when I was there, they were on the on the ironically, if you if you like, on the walls of the Ministry of Commerce in Pyongyang. There were mm. two huge photos, one of Karl Marx and the other of uh, Lenin mm. uh, were there. And a few years later, these, uh, uh, these um, uh, huge portraits were taken down. Mm. And I, 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 at that time, I even took pictures because uh, DHL and FedEx, they had an agreement with the Ministry of Commerce that they uh, could could work could uh, could offer their services. Uh, so there were some vans with the FedEx and DHL uh, markings on their on their uh, delivery vans, uh, uh, standing in front of the building <laughs> of the Ministry of Commerce. And Lenin and Karl Marx looked down to them. So above was the system of communism, and below was the system of capitalism. <laughs> so it was a funny combination. But it's an interesting it taken, dichotomy. Yeah, it, it was it was taken off, and also even from the constitution, they took the um, you know it was stipulated in the constitution that North Korea would have to go towards communism. That would be the final goal. Right. That was also removed from the constitution, but they added then the the uh, the Song Songun paragraph into the constitution. Songun means military first. Uh, but now also that has been um, uh, uh, is not not of, of is not um, uh, um, it's a removed. policy anymore. It's not okay. it's it's, it's chuche. chuche is the policy and Kim Il Sungism and, and and these things. But it's less let's say ideologically it has it has a little bit um, changed as well. It's not not sure. diehard communism or things like that anymore. Okay. Um, going to Pablo, um, so with this, uh, these ideologies, this Juche uh, ideology, and also the communist laws that they have in North Korea around the economy, what reforms do you think they would need to make? You've got that legal and economic background. So what do they need to change? What do they need to do in order to start reforming from a legal perspective? Well, from it's a very interesting uh, point and question. Uh, well, uh, what ideally uh, we will have to expect uh, what Gorbachev uh, did in the Soviet Union, but the problem is that Kim is not Gorbachev, so uh, it's very uh, difficult. It's very improbable to to expect uh, and that Kim acts like uh, Gorbachev, uh, making uh, policies like Perestroika and Glasnost. So restructuring uh, policies and uh, openness uh, policies. Um, but of course, uh, as I said in my presentation, Kim is not averse to changes. He's making some reforms, some small reforms. So 
he wants he he realized that in south korea they are doing better they are rich they are more prosperous so um if he wants to to continue in power for the next decades um give the power to some relative or uh, his uh, daughter or son or or sister i don't know uh, he will need to make uh, more ambitious uh, reforms hmm. so i really think that if not kim maybe another politician in north korea will need uh, will need to make a kind of perestroika or glasnost uh, mm, not uh, very late i think uh, so mm, i think that the model is in this sense uh, vietnam but also uh, the, the the big uh, picture will be the soviet union because it was the last uh, big uh, um, communist country so i think that the process uh, is written in the books we know what to do in order to open the free markets to promote economy to make uh, growth uh, so i think that they 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 only need to listen to others like this forum, that this seminar, and to uh, they have a lot of tips in order to make some reforms and open the and open the country to the to the global economy and to integrate uh, North Korea into the main uh, international organizations. Um, so yes, I think that uh, the the turning point will be the emerging middle class in North Korea. Mm. So the middle class is uh, probably the key element in every uh, kind of political change. So he will be very uh, careful to to not to to give uh, political power to this new emerging uh, middle class in North Korea if he if he try to make some reforms. Mm. Felix, do you have any comments on this question as well? What would, what advice would you give to Kim, Kim Jong Un in order to what uh, laws or policies he should should change in order to encourage economic reform? I would uh, advise him to um, to reallocate some of the resources that he uh, needs for a huge conventional army to the civilian sector. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, of course, he, uh, he will need to, to maintain his nuclear uh, development program because uh, that is much cheaper and also more effective than an, uh, an army which is uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, dilapidated, which, which, which uh, uh, is no, no, has not much use in a war, in a conventional war. So, but, but the cost is very costly. If you have more than a million men uh, in, a, in, a, in a country with a population of 25 million, that's a big, big financial burden. So I would, I would uh, uh, say reduce, uh, take from the military, uh, and reallocate it to the civilian sector, allow more, more uh, uh, private uh, business activities. And uh, perhaps he has to, to invite more Chinese companies. That, that's probably the only ones that, that would come or ca can come at the moment. Uh, right. But at least they would bring new technology and some capital infusions. So we want to wrap it up now. Um, we've kind of gone a little bit over what I was hoping, but it's been a really interesting discussion. Uh, I'd like to invite you, uh, if you, each of you, if you'd like to make a, like a one minute statement uh, to kind of wrap up um, what you would recommend or your advice, I guess, as to how the reunification of North Korea could be accelerated. So uh, does anybody want to go first? Um, Pablo, I'm going to ask well, you. <laughs> I, I, I think that this topic uh, we are dealing in this session is uh, ski, not only because uh, it's a big uh, issue in, at in, in a global level, it's because we are humans and we want the peace and security in all the planet. So uh, we need to understand how the human being works, how the human beings interact with each other. 
and the way North Korean is acting is not uh, very human. They need to be open. They need to be to 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 try to exchange uh, their knowledge to accept new ideas. Of course, uh, we 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 can help them, and also we can learn from them. In some points, we can learn from them. So I am a scholar. I am a legal practitioner, but I, I, I am also a jurist, um, I'm a professor in university, and really want to, to make some exchange experiences in North Korea. Why not? Why not? But it's impossible. So we need to learn, we need to, to share the best we, th we had in our countries uh, um, and contribute to a, a better world. So uh, I think in, this, uh, in economic terms, we need to promote free trade, freedom, of uh, um, and other civil liberties in order to reach uh, a better world for uh, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And Felix? Well, uh, North Korea has been divided, uh, Korea has been divided now for um, seven decades. And there, uh, there has been uh, technically, there's still, the Korean War is still going on because there's only an armistice. So I would make an appeal to politicians in both Washington and Pyongyang to try to end the war with a, with a peace, with a formal peace agreement to normalize uh, the relations between the two sides, which would, uh, which would have at least two major uh, benefits. One, would be that um, it would be a first important step towards reunification of the two Koreas. It would uh, also uh, uh, allow more, more uh, uh, engagement with the outside world, more trade, more investment, more other cultural activities with the outside world. And it would make the peninsula a much safer, uh, a much safer place. So my uh, appeal is to these politicians to think if it's not time after seven decades to dare the step towards peace, towards lasting peace. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you. I really appreciate your um, contributions, especially all the work you put into the presentation. And to you, Felix, for uh, staying up until two o'clock in the morning to talk to us. Um, next time, we'll do it the other way, and I'll stay up at two o'clock in the morning. How about that? And we'll be even. Okay. <laughs> dear, dear. <laughs> Yeah, we would. Uh, I'd actually like to uh, really um, explore your book in a little more detail. So maybe we can have one of those discussions in the future. But um, we'll talk a little bit later about that. So thank you very much, also to our participants. I'm sorry we didn't thank get so to much. all the questions that were coming in. There were some really good questions, but because of time, we'll have to, uh, you know, save those for another uh, webinar. Uh, we have these every Tuesday, and there'll be another one next week. If you're not on our email list, you can sign up on us.upf.org to be informed of future events. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, Pablo. Thank again. you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you thank next you. time.